Good morning. Um, our education committee is is back in session again this morning. It's uh, April 9th, 2021. And our uh, guest this morning uh, with us is uh, Ed Fisher from the Agency of Education, and uh, he will be give, giving us an update this morning. Uh, thank you, Ted, for being with us, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So the floor is yours. Apologies, I had myself doubly muted. Good morning, House Education. For the record, my name is Ted Fisher from the Vermont Agency of Education. I'm the Director of uh, Communications and Legislative Affairs, and I also manage one of the agency's COVID-19 response teams. Um, I am actually on the schedule for two things. So, Mr. Vice Chairman, um, I would like uh, to ask what your preference would be. Um, I'm scheduled to walk through a strong and healthy year which is our updated uh, safety and health guidance with the Vermont Department of Health. I'm also scheduled to give my um, regular, although we haven't been able to hold one for the last few weeks, uh, COVID update briefing. So does the committee have a preference as to which item we tackle first? I think maybe the COVID update briefing, um, and I presume relative to school openings, et cetera. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So let me just move around my notes here for a moment. Okay. So I already said good morning and for the record, um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide a weekly situation report on the pandemic as it impacts education in Vermont. This is a similar briefing to one Secretary French provides on a weekly basis to Vermont superintendents. And after a short oral briefing, I'll do my best to answer questions related to AOE's response and recovery efforts. If there's something I cannot answer, we'll do our best to follow up post briefing or provide more information at our next status update. Um, so in terms of the COVID-19 context, um, we haven't done one of these in a little while. So I'll just note that um, as you've probably seen reported in the news uh, or, or heard in testimony or seen in, uh, in the governor's press conferences, we've had, had um, some pretty high case counts um, statewide over the past few weeks. Um, and although we are seeing some trends uh, down a little bit um, in the last few days, um, the, uh, that this has come along with a large number of uh, situations um, and uh, outbreaks in schools that the health department, um, the EPI team and the outbreak prevention and response teams have been uh, working with school districts to respond to. Um, the state's modeling um, still shows a drop in cases occurring around the end of April, and um, this is due to the result of vaccinations. Um, and our Vermont D data um, mirrors national data in that we're starting to see the um, average case age, um, like the average age of cases drop. Um, and so more, we're seeing more case activity in the 20 to 29 age group um, as, as older Vermonters um, become vaccinated. Um, so the, the B117 variant is now the dominant strain of virus, um, and we are see, still seeing very good data about um, vaccination working. So that's the really good news. We are continuing our surveillance testing um, for school staff, um, although as more and more education staff become, uh, uh, become vaccinated, that, will, that surveillance testing will be for staff who, are, who remain unvaccinated. Um, I'll just note very briefly that yesterday, because I'll go over this in, in the second half of uh, my testimony today, um, but yesterday we did release the uh, Strong and Healthy Year, which is the new safety and health guidance um, for, uh, for Vermont schools, and we can come back to that. Um, what I will note is that uh, as a result of this has happened every time, this is the third issuance of this, excuse me, the fourth issuance of this guidance. It was originally issued in June of last year. Um, when we do updates to it, we get questions and we um, will then update additional documents. And I'll go over a little bit more in detail about sort of what that process looks like um, when I testify. But there will be additional guidance forthcoming on things like end of year activities and graduate, uh, graduations, uh, the return potentially of in person school board meetings, things of that nature, which are sort of the natural follow on questions that come um, as a result of updating this guidance. So we, uh, we understand that the U.S. Department of Education is going to be also releasing um, the next volume in its operation 
guidance handbook for schools in the near future. This is non-regulatory guidance. Um, we also expect that they'll issue some additional guidance on ESSER and the ARPA, um, the American uh, uh, Recovery Plan Act, um, around maintenance of effort and maintenance of equity. Um, so we're watching that carefully. Uh, we're also waiting for and hoping for additional spending guidance by the end of the month. Um, there's some trends, still some transitions at the federal level that are going on. Um, there's not much more on the financial side to note. Um, FEMA did uh, release ex uh, expected guidance um, the other day, and we're um, still working with our partners to understand what that means. Schools do qualify for, for FEMA funds for a range of activities, so we're, we're working to understand what the implications of that are. So the remainder of my briefing for today, um, I know that you've heard testimony on assessment and um, accountability. We posted the assessment waiver um, in the public comment. It's out for public comment now, and that comment period closes at the end of April. Um, and I'll also just note uh, that there, uh, there has been some, there will be some announcement at the press conference today um, about uh, some of our summer work um, and working to make sure that every uh, child and adolescent has access to engaging and, and fun uh, work this summer. And uh, so we'll be releasing some more details about that. Um, and I think that um, I, I'm, I'm not the best person to speak about that in the future, but I'm sure we can bring in folks, perhaps Deputy Secretary Boucher, to speak more about that um, in, the, uh, in the near future. So that is my, uh, my COVID status update briefing for today. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now or transition into talking about the Strong and Healthy Year document, whichever the chair would prefer. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Representative Austin? Yep, thank you. Just, you may not be able to answer these right now, um, but I just am curious, I, got, I did get an email from a constituent about uh, vaccine passports, if the educational, if the AOE is gonna uh, make any requirements about uh, vaccine passports. I'm curious about the percent of staff that have been vaccinated thus far, and if there's any thoughts about when children can be vaccinated, if there's any, and again, I know you may not be able to answer these, but if there's gonna be any uh, guidance around children being vaccinated once it's available. Thank you. So thank you, Representative, because I realized I forgot to put into my notes something that I've been working a lot on this past month, <laughs> um, because it's actually really good news and I completely buried the lead and I apologize. So um, we know as of, this is actually week old data at this point, but we know as of last week that 80% um, of eligible education system staff um, at least, because we, there's some, some variability in the numbers, we're not, able to perfectly capture everyone from combining multiple data sources, but at least 80% as of last week um, of eligible education system staff had either were either registered or had received their first dose of vaccine. So that's really excellent news. Um, and it tracks with what we understood in terms of the interest. Um, now, uh, the vaccination program that the state is running for school staff is sort of been merged. Originally, we were doing standalone clinics for education staff, oftentimes in schools or in community locations, very specifically. And now we're sort of moving into this streamlined where if you are an education system staff who's eligible, um, you will be able to access um, the same community clinics that anyone would. So if you're not eligible to sign up via the age bands or via another eligibility category, you would, um, you would be able to log into the same system and, and regis register the way you would. And of course, folks can continue to go to pharmacies. So at this point, what, what we're really looking at is just trying to get our numbers over the line. We watch this sort of happen where, um, you know, there's a very quick rise um, in terms of the number of folks when a new category is opened up, a lot of folks go and register and get their shots and then we just sort of see the numbers creep up. So so we're looking looking and we're going to, we're working with the rest of the state in terms of positive messaging to get the word out to folks, encourage folks to, to get their shot, things like that. Um, but I, I would say we're very pleased with where we stand um, system-wide, which is, which is really, really good news. 
Um, with regard to your question about vaccine passports, I'm not 100% sure. So, and I don't want to speak for the for the state on this one because there have been some questions about what the requirements will be in terms of vaccination in in various sectors. Um, I think right now the recommendation is that folks get vaccinated as soon as they're eligible. Um, but there's there's no requirement to do so. I've heard mention of the term vaccine passports when it comes to travel. I will just note that from a human resources perspective, um, there's no requirement that folks be vaccinated as a school staff. I don't know. I, I don't believe that that would be a requirement in the future, but I'm not, I can't, I can't, I can't say what the future will hold. Um, for students right now, um, we, we still are in a position where, and we haven't gotten to the eligibility category of 16 plus that will occur on the 19th. So a week from Monday um, is when 16 plus um, of Vermonters will be able to sign up. Um, so for the majority of students, um, of course, won't be eligible for a vaccine until we have a, an emergency youth authorization for a vaccine um, for children. Um, and, I, and I imagine that, that will happen at some point, but I'm far from an expert uh, <laughs> in that area. So, so I don't know what, you know, when we, ask, when we talk about what student vaccination looks like, we know that some of our students in our high schools will be eligible in a few weeks. We don't know what the picture will look like for students, um, you know, as we go into the fall, for example. Thank you. Representative Brady. <clears throat> Hello. Can you say anything more about the summer details, or do we have to wait till the press conference? <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I'm not a perfect vessel for this. I just don't have more information than what I gave you. Um, I know that there is an announcement today, and there's a lot of planning work going on, so consider that an on-the-record suggestion that you ask us to come back. Um, and, uh, yeah, I apologize. I, I just don't, I don't have more information. Well, thank you for that. And I guess we can move on, Ted, and go to your next subject. Absolutely. So um, I'm not going to share my screen, but uh, Jesse uh, has has posted to your uh, committee website um, the updated version of a strong and healthy year. Uh, this is the this is the updated strong and healthy start safety and health guidance for Vermont schools. This document was originally issued in June of 2020, and it was updated again in August of 2020, and then again in October. Um, and schools have been operating in using the October version until yesterday when we issued a revised uh, version for the remainder of the school year. So the most, so, so the, the, the theory of action here um, is that as we move into the spring and as we see uh, vaccination um, pick up among adults and, and see the uh, anticipated and hopeful decline in case counts, um, we're working to uh, make changes in this document to streamline, reduce complexity, and where possible lift requirements. Um, so part of this is that Vermont schools have nearly a full year of experience operating safely, um, and many of the things that needed explicit guidance at the beginning of the year no longer need emphasis. Um, so, for example, Vermont schools uh, have done a, across the board a really excellent job with working with COVID coordinators to um, develop the systems that are needed to respond and operate during the pandemic, um, and we didn't need several pages of, of guidance on how to stand that up because the schools have that, um, that uh, you know, lived experience under their belt. And we also now at this point have created, the, particularly the health department's um, school child care branch of the health operations center has created a, a very large range of toolkits and specific subject matter expertise information. Um, so, so it's really gone beyond the scope of the original, original document. So that's a, an example of trying to streamline some of those requirements. Um, we're also doing our best to redraft guidance to refer and align to other state guidance and requirements in the hope that as conditions have improved and other guidance is eased, restrictions on school operations would similarly lift. Um, so an example of this is the travel guidance. Um, the Vermont Forward Plan was announced on Tuesday. 
Um, it has some changes to the travel requirements, which are effective today. Um, and so our updated guidance refers to those travel requirements um, for school districts to use um, and uh, lists the requirement for a travel screen um, as part of the uh, you know, morning screening uh, for folks to enter the building. Um, with regard to specific requirements, uh, the, the, the guidance now has a three foot distance for students of all grade levels. Previously, the distance was six feet for students in the secondary grades, and this is in alignment with updated CDC recommendation, as well as a lot of um, information and evidence we've seen um, both uh, in, in uh, the United States and, and internationally. Um, there's some changes to the health screening requirements, as I just alluded to, that also includes um, vaccination considerations um, and moves uh, screenings to be completed before coming to school rather than at the entry to the school building. Um, we also relax restrictions on the use of communal space. This is something that was sort of in progress in a negotiation um, over the past few months, working with some specific subject matter groups like music educators. Um, but, but at this point, um, there's, there's some, some greater and demonstrated ability to safely use communal space. Students must still wear masks and adhere to physical distancing requirements. Um, and then the, um, the alignment of physical education and music education, we've issued separate music education guidance and the physical education will now follow um, applicable sports guidance um, for the remainder of the year. Um, also with the return of spring, at any time folks are um, doing physical education, the activities should continue to take place outside if at all possible, because that's the safest um, place for, for physical education to occur. Um, two other things that are important to note is that we've ended requirements for cohorts and pods for younger students. Um, and we're allowing volunteers to return to school buildings, um, although buildings are still closed to, um, to visitors. Interesting. Oh, and I should note one other additional change. The CDC made some pretty large changes to their recommendations for cleaning and disinfecting. Um, so folks who um, are familiar with the old standard, which had a lot of use of um, chemical disinfectants and things will note that a lot of those have been changed. The evidence really, the, my, my sort of short version understanding of this is that um, uh, soap and water or detergents are sufficient in most cases to reduce risk. Um, the only time that a really true, sort of what we think of as a heavy disinfection is needed is if there is a, a positive case um, that has been um, in the building, then, then you would need to do a more disinfection. But if, in terms of just reducing regular risk, the cleaning and disinfection um, guidance is now to use the normal cleaning products and solvents that would be used, um, you know, in, the, in sort of pre-COVID operations. Well, thank you very much, Ted, once again, for your very comprehensive reports. We appreciate it. And it's Certainly good information as we move forward. Um, it will be wonderful to have our schools open again, um, and hopefully sooner than later. Um, do we have any questions for Mr. Fisher this morning? Representative James. Thanks, Chair Cooperly, or Vice Chair Cooperly. <laughs> Sorry, Chair Webb. Um, Ted, how um, you mentioned that, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch all of this. You mentioned that screenings will now be done before school instead of upon arrival at school. And I was wondering how that, how that works. Or maybe I misheard you. No, so, um, so you're, you're absolutely right. So, some schools are, are actually doing this already, um, and the agency in part developed a, a health screening tool to that, that I'm not certain which districts are using it um, to allow folks to you to, to do this. So so some so I can't speak. There is some flexibility. We don't we don't lay out specific requirements as to how they do this, but the idea would be, um, and now I'm reading from the guidance. Um, Staff and students and their families should complete an exposure and symptom screening before departing for school. Anyone who has been exposed to COVID-19 unless vaccinated or who has COVID-19 symptoms should not come to school and should follow the Department of Health guidance regarding quarantine and testing. Um, so really it's about 
do I have a temperature? Do I have a fever? Do I have COVID symptoms? If I don't, then you shouldn't be coming to school today. Um, you shouldn't be leaving the house in, in general um, uh, if, you, if you have COVID symptoms. Um, so it's moving from a checkpoint at the door, which some, some schools are doing it. Uh, there's a range of different ways, but some schools are having folks fill out a little slip and bringing it to the school building and, and handing it off. This just says that this is something that should occur prior to people um, arriving and schools no longer have to check at the door to make sure that they're that they're doing that. Is it like a little online survey that you fill out and and submit or is it um, like the honor system just telling people this is don't come to school if you have COVID? <laughs> so so we developed a, a, an, a, an application that that is similar to that an online survey. I know some other schools are using their own versions of that. They there's nothing to prevent them from continuing to do that. But if a school tells their family, look, here are the parameters in which we want you to absolutely not come to school, but you no longer need to tell us affirmatively that you don't have these symptoms, that's acceptable under this guidance. It's a, it's a, it is a relaxation of that requirement. Um, I, will just, I will just say that there is, there is nothing, if a school determines that it is in their best interest and what they need for their community to keep a standard that's stricter, than the standards in this guidance, then then they're then they're able to do that. Of course, um, it's a it's a conversation for them to have with their community. Um, but but the strict requirement that there be a screening is no longer in force. Thank you, Representative Austin. Uh, um, I'm just wondering since we don't I don't believe we have a lot more time left uh, in the session. If it would be possible to your weekly reports to kind of update us on the summer uh, plans and how uh, the agency is gonna, uh, you know, how schools are gonna address loss of learning over the summer? Yes, I would, I would absolutely love to, either I can come and provide that or, or work with um, Jesse and my colleagues, Maureen and Suzanne to schedule an appropriate person to come and update the committee if that's if that's what you like we don't have that um yeah it, i may not be the best vehicle for, for that update but we'd certainly be be would love to come in and give you more information when we can thank you representative webb chair webb hi and th thanks ted um you are getting the uh the needs assessments will be complete by then. So you, you'll have an idea of what the different districts need at this point. So, and you're, you are gonna be reporting on that for us, I believe, correct? Or, or that needs to be on the schedule, uh, your update. Yes, so so yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately this morning, I don't have a, a good picture of where, where we stand with that, but yes, I, I think, again, it may not be me as the best person, but we can certainly work to, to get in the right folks to talk about that. 